Hello, my name is Dr. Dan Gordon. I'm uh, the lead author for this study, uh, which is going to cover the physiological and training characteristics of recreational marathon runners. I'm based at the Cambridge Centre for Sport and Exercise Sciences, Anglia Ruskin University UK, uh, where the majority of the, the co-authors are based, and we have an additional co-author, which is Sarah Whiteman, who's from the Flying Runner, also based in Cambridge UK. The rationale for this study really was to understand those training and physiological characteristics of recreational marathon runners. There's an awful lot of literature that's been published about elite athletes, but the, there is very little on these recreational runners, and yet the majority of runners competing in the big city marathons are what would be termed non-elite. So these are athletes really with times ranging from about two and a half hours, anything down to about five and a half hours. And we have little understanding of, of, of these athletes, both in terms of what they should be doing and what they are doing in training, and actually what the physiological responses are and their characteristics are. And that formed the, the, the rationale for this study was to, to, to address these. To do this, we recruited 97 recreational marathon runners, um, and they had an average time of 229 uh, minutes for the marathon, plus or minus about 40 minutes. Um, we had 97, as I say, runners, of which 34 of the runners were female and 63 of the runners were male. The athletes reported to the laboratory in Cambridge for, for a single visit, uh, and during that visit they completed an uh, incremental treadmill test to volition exhaustion. Uh, so we used three-minute stages. We recorded, as you can see on the images below, breath-by-breath -breath data um, for the analysis of oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, minute ventilation, tidal volume. Um, additionally, at the end of each three minute stage, we collected capillary sample for determination of blood lactate responses. This trial went on until we got past a point referred to as lactate turn point. Um, once we'd done that, the participants were given a seven minute recovery. They then completed an incremental test from that point where we started the test at that lactate turn point. Now we, we locked the speed but raised the gradient by 1% per minute until we took them to the point of volitional exhaustion, which is the VO2 max. Additionally, all the participants were asked to complete quite a substantial questionnaire which related to training history, training characteristics, and also we looked at um, uh, values related to incidents of injury and, and, and so on. So what did we find? Well, the paper summarises a large number of, of characteristics, everything from blood lactate responses, running economy, VO2 max. We looked at the association between the, the lactate responses and, and, and race speed, and even VO2 max and race speed. And we found quite significant differences between these groups. Perhaps these, these are not necessarily, necessarily surprising, but it's the fact that they have not been reported in the literature, but quite profound differences. Within the, within the groups. In fact, if you look at the two graphs which are, are coloured, so the, the, the top left, which is the blood lactate responses, the faster runners are the blue line, progressing across to the slower runners, which is the green line, and the same for the running economy. Additionally, we looked at a lot of the training characteristics, and we can see all of these reported here, everything from training distance, we looked at average training speed, we looked at things like training volume, we looked at training load, we looked at distance per session, and we even started to look at how big the training zones were that these athletes were undertaking. But there's an awful lot more information that's reported within the study. But again, quite profound, significant differences were evident between those in the faster groups to the slower groups. And we found that there were quite marked associations between a number of the training characteristics and race performance, and a number of the training characteristics and physiological characteristics. So the paper really concludes that training frequency coupled with absolute training speed appear to be the fundamental performance progression characteristics. And that seems to be the, the area where we got discrimination between those in the two and a half hour to three hour group to those down in our greater than four and a half hour group. We also suggest that a lot of the emphasis in training should be on maximizing running speed, but there is this recognition that training time is limited in, in, in this group of athletes. They don't have an abundance of training time, so it's maximizing the amount of time. And so one of the, the con conclusions is about optimizing training in those short periods of time and making sure that they, they adopt smart training.
So once you've read the paper, if you want to know more, please do email me at dan.gordon at anglia.ac.uk or you can follow us in terms of our research activities on Twitter at SESRG underscore AIU.